for those of you who are wondering, um, this is Rick Hansen's Wednesday night meditation, and I am not Rick Hansen, <laughs> but I am his trusty sidekick booker, and um, I am stepping in, subbing for Rick um, just a few weeks ago and tonight as well so that he can be with his family over the holidays. So I'm really happy to um, be here and to explore practice with you all. So let's see, I kind of gave away what I'm talking about tonight, but I just want to say, you know, at the beginning of my practice, I had a really, really great fortune of meeting Bhante Buddha Rakita, who was a monk from Uganda in the Insight lineage. And Bonte had trained at Spirit Rock, just like I did in the four-year teacher training, and then went on to take robes. And so I met Bonte on my very first retreat and was really blown away by him, really inspired um, by him, by the way that he moves through the, en- through the world and his energy. And through a lot of effort and faith, About six months after my first retreat, I went to Uganda um, to set a private retreat with Bonte. And in my last few days, I started to really stress out. I was a much younger person than I am today. And I lived a very full and active life in New York City. And I was really trying to figure out how I was going to take this amazing experience of being on a personal retreat with a monk in Uganda and to somehow take this home and integrate it into my life, knowing that I didn't want to become a monastic. And so I wanted to ask someone for advice. And my my only companions really during this time were um, a cow, a chicken that hung out with a cow a dog that would only come when we meditated during the day, and then Bonte, this monk. And I figured that Bonte was the only one that could actually respond to me and give me an answer. And so I chose to ask Bonte, how do I do this? How do I take this home? And Bonte said to me, practice has to be your life and your life has to be your practice. There can be no separation. And at the time, I thought, this is the worst advice I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> I have no idea what that means or, or how to really like make that, that advice work in my life. But I knew that there was something really brilliant there. I knew that there was this really wise nugget that I needed to kind of put into my pocket and just live into over the next few years of my practice. And so what I realized that Bonte was asking me was to live a life that was not fragmented, to live a life with intention and integrity, a life that was integrated and whole. And this is when I began to get curious about the precepts in each aspect of my life these five ethical guidelines that we take on the first night of retreat rooted in the foundation of non-harming. So each word I said, each action I took, each partner that I was with, I reflected before, during, and after, was this action causing affliction to myself or others? Or was it bringing a sense of harmony and liberation to us? When I was here a few weeks ago, Chris from Australia, um, who uh, reminded me that he had sat retreat with Rick and I a few years ago. And he said, you were really serious about the precepts during that time. Like it was really your thing. <laughs> and I've been reflecting on that um, since we were together a few weeks ago. And yeah, um, the precepts are absolutely a foundation of my practice. If I truly believe that my liberation is tied up with yours and yours with mine, 
why wouldn't I do everything possible to care for you and to protect you? So sila, the Pali word for moral conduct, um, is guides us through how we move through the world, how we take care of ourselves and each other, and how we take care of our earth. In the Eightfold Path, Sila is the first bucket. It lays out the groundwork and the foundation to make sure that the heart and mind is attuned with skillful speech, skillful action, and skillful livelihood. This foundation is the soil, and from it, the rest of the teachings of the Dharma can grow. We'll be looking at Sila tonight through the lens of the paramis, these 10 perfections or attainments that were practiced by the Brahman, the Brahman Sumedha for eons before he became uh, Siddhartha Gautama, who would sit under the Bodhi tree and become the Buddha that we know of today. And so Sila, from this view of, um, of the paramis, focuses on skillful action and unfolds into the five precepts, this list of things that we recite on the first night of retreat all the things that we're going to abstain from, the things that we're not going to do while we're on retreat. And this includes non-harming, not stealing, not engaging with our sexual energy, not speaking and not using intoxicants. And for me, the language of abstaining from has always felt really harsh and not very fun. Um, and it really emphasizes this negative bias that many of us um, experience in our, in our everyday lives. Telling someone not to do something isn't the same as telling them what to do and why we are doing it. And so we'll be working with the version of the precepts that reminds me that I'm engaging in these practices to support and protect myself and others because we are interconnected and my conscious or unconscious actions will impact you and yours will impact me. And so knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined, I undertake the precept to protect life. Knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined, I undertake the precept to be generous. Knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined, I undertake the precept to protect my sexuality and those of others. Knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined, I undertake the precept to be careful with my speech. And knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined, I undertake the precepts to be free of intoxicants for a clear mind and heart. So when I was with you all a couple of weeks ago, I shared my social location from where I was uh, speaking the Dharma. And, um, and so as you all know, I'm a black queer American woman and my life is at the intersection of dharma, embodied wisdom, and social justice. And so that means that I am fueled by an ethic of love and faith, justice, and equity. So when this is your so social location and the dharma is your practice, one is very aware of our world and all that stands against everything that we stand for. I pay attention and bring these precepts into every aspect of my life as a roadmap to keep my integrity and my dignity in check so I don't get swallowed up by this world around me. So tonight, I thought we would talk about the fifth precept, 
caring for the intoxicants for a clear heart and mind. And my dear friend and colleague, Sylvia Borstein, refers to the fifth precept as the practice precept that completes the first, which again, being that commitment to protect life. So when most of us think about intoxicants, we typically think about things like drugs and alcohol that interfere with our ability to access clear knowing and can lead to the harming of ourselves and others. And many folks to sobriety to support this commitment to not harming. And I wanna bring our attention to other intoxicants that can also cloud our hearts and minds and interrupt or deny our connection to ourselves and others. In the climate we are in today, this can look like our sensationalized news media, our social media, our handheld gadgets, and what a lot of us choose for our entertainment. And these things can also confuse the heart and mind when we believe what we are told and not seeing for ourselves, um, which was a very clear instruction from the Buddha. He said, Ehipasako, to come and see for yourself, to not trust what you read or even to trust a teacher but to really explore and get to know these teachings for yourself and to see what's true, what really resonates for you. So for me, every intoxicant that I can think of that puts up this barrier to my truth can be dropped into a bucket of one of the three poisons of greed, hatred, or delusion. Buddha Dasa pithily refers to the three poisons as a, a pulling in, a pushing away, or running around in circles. So when ignorance is present in my life and I begin to believe that the social conditioning around me that is rooted in the oppression of others is true, I know that my heart and mind have been colonized by these three poisons. When I forget my true nature and I'm not able to see the humanity in others, I meet anger with anger and fear with fear. When we're paying attention, we can see how these poisons can lead to our unhappiness and suffering. And just on the other side is a possibility of great liberation and freedom. And we can feel this in our bodies through Hiri and Otapa, these two bright qualities that protect the world. And so Hiri, which is spelled H-I-R-I, Hiri is more of an internal gauge. It's that feeling we get in the pit of our stomach. And for me, I get a tingling in my armpits. Um, and it's our conscious coming online. When we've done or said something that is not in alignment with our values. Hiri allows us to keep our self-respect and our dignity by gently reminding us of who we are. She invites us into our courage. And otapa is more external and relational. It's that sweet quality that allows us to move through the world with dignity and nobility, knowing that we have done nothing that is blameworthy. Otapa checks us when we are about to do something that might get a side eye from those that we really respect. This ally in protecting the world is driven by being connected to something bigger than ourselves. It supports us in remembering that we are accountable to other living beings 
in our words, our deeds, and our actions. It reminds us that we are social beings and we, we belong to each other. And this is easy to be reflected back when we surround ourselves with wise friends who've also committed to being on this path with us. Kalyanamita, these spiritual friends who are good and admirable and noble. We turn towards these virtuous friendships for perspective, especially when we're not sure if we're seeing things right-sized. I was under a writing deadline um, a couple of weeks ago, and I reached out to one of my dearest, Kalyanamita, who is also a Dharma teacher and a writer. And I told her that I hadn't been writing, but I'd just been fear, like, you know, ferociously cleaning my home. And she said, oh, you've been sweeping your temple. And she went on to say that there is nothing cleaner than a writer's home who's under a deadline. And there was something both literally and metaphorically that I loved and so deeply appreciated about that wisdom that she dropped in, dropped in for me. Removing the clutter sets up the conditions for a heart, mind, and body that can move through the world with ease. And getting curious with these precepts and our everyday lives is like sweeping our temples. It clears out the three poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion, creating the space that is needed to invite in tenderness and care and generosity. Which is, of course, going back to the beginning of the precepts, remembering how deeply our lives are intertwined we undertake the precept to protect life. And so knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined, what gets in the way? What gets, what's the hindrance that, um, that really inhabits us the ability to undertake the precept to protect life? to be generous, to care for the sexuality of myself and others, to be careful with my speech and to care for intoxicants that cloud my heart and mind. And so dear ones, thank you so much for your kind attention and listening to the Dharma with me this evening. And so I would like to take this time to open up to what some people call questions and answers or questions and more questions or um, what my dear friend Bonnie Duran calls wisdom democracy. So I wanna know what came up for you this evening in my talk. What is a precept that you're struggling with and what gets in the way? And also what supports your practice of caring for each other, of carrying them in your heart and mind and in all aspects of your life. And so we're going to open up the floor and what that looks like is if you have a question or comment, you can raise your little blue hand by going into participants and hitting the button that says raised hand. And if you have a question, if you don't want to be on camera with me, you can also type your question into the chat. Um, I have a hard time tracking both. And so I am going to invite Tom to read um, some questions and then I will be responding live to anyone who wants to, to come on and speak with me directly. All righty. And so, um, Tom, I think I saw a question come into the chat. Would you mind reading that for me? Sure. Thank you so much. Mm 
Uh, here's a question from Joy. Can you speak to self-forgiveness when you have failed? When you have self-forgiveness, when you have what? Failed. When you have failed. Can I speak to self-forgiveness when you have failed? So first of all, dear one, just using the word I failed, it breaks my heart a little bit. It really does. It, it breaks my heart because we are born into this precious human form and being born into this human form means that we're here to practice at life. And so sometimes, you know, we, we feel like there might be a failing, but that's just um, an opportunity for us to try again. And so forgiving yourself looks like just saying, oh, dear one, you're learning something new. Maybe you didn't succeed the way that you thought that it was going to roll out, but there is more opportunities. And also to, as my, my dear friend Chachi, who I, I taught with for many years, she would often say to, to beat yourself with a feather. So to really be gentle with yourself. Um, we're supposed to be practicing and exploring and learning about life. And so I don't believe that we are possible of failing unless we don't get up and try again. So again, um, I see a lot of things coming in through the chat. And so Tom, maybe there's some sure. other ones that you can read. Thank you. Sure. And again, if you can, if you want to raise your hand and speak to me directly, we can also do that. So go yeah. ahead, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, we don't have any hands raised right yep. now. But we do um, have a comment. Um, I wonder how you address delusion because how do you even know? <laughs> <laughs> that is a brilliant question. And that's the sneaky thing about delusion, right? I think it's Buddha Dasa who said there is no, um, there is nothing like the net of delusion because we get so tangled up in thinking that things are true and it gets really confusing, right? And so this is where spiritual friends come in people that you can lean on to reflect back to you when you're, when, you know, I love this expression, when I'm not seeing things right sized, when I say, I think that this is going on, but there's something that's a little, there's a little something in my gut that's making me think that this might not be true. <laughs> and so I often reach out to my Kalyanami, to my spiritual friends um, for that guidance and that support and helping me to, to see things a little bit more clearly. And so I see that Yuli has raised their mm -hmm. hand. So hi, Yuli. And can you unmute yourself? Maybe Tom can support you in yeah, that. I'll get her Great, her. thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, Yulia, I think you can unmute now. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to. Um, I wanted to thank you so much, Leslie, for being here and for your teaching. Um, I'm at the very beginning stage of learning everything, um, the Dharma, the meditation. And, um, and um, I wanted to say that perhaps it's just where I have, um, man what I have managed to find. I found myself listening to and learning from lots of um, white men. They're all lovely, wise, amazing um, men and uh, I love them very much in their teaching, but it's just so amazing to see you here. Mm. Um, and I appreciate um, everything that you just mentioned. Um, in particular, I'm really fascinated by what you just mentioned about the sensation in our bodies that kind of is, I guess this hidden wisdom within ourselves reminding us of things um, that we might not be immediately conscious of. Um, it would be wonderful if you could elaborate on that, how that works and why we have that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we've got that spidey sense in our bodies. 
Yeah. So, you know, the first foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of body and breath. And people are sort of like, yeah, 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 body, breath, got it. There is a body, there is a breath. Let's talk about like the mental formations. And I invite everyone to not sleep on body and breath. There's a reason why the Buddha gave that as the first foundation. Because that is where um, we get to know everything else from the Dharma. It is rooted in this felt sense in the body. And we live in a culture, and I'm speaking for myself as a person living in the West, um, but I think it's a pretty universal thing that we've been, we've sort of been taught to have our minds be this thing that sort of like lug our bodies around. We don't typically honor the wisdom of our body. We don't honor our intuition. And this is also so connected to how we don't honor the feminine because this is um, connected and related. Our intuition, our wisdom, that felt sense in the body, this is that feminine quality um, that is so connected to the earth and us having this intimate relationship with knowing when things are a little off. And so, you know, mindfulness of body and breath, some people think as a preliminary teaching. And to me, I think that it is one of the most important teachings to really spend time learning how to be in a more intimate relationship and cultivating a a tenderness and a sensitivity. And so that means to pay closer attention in our practice to when we start practicing to kind of check in to see where we are in that moment, how the body, the breath, the heart, the mind is before we begin our practice. To bring our hands to our belly and feel the breath moving in and out of our body. And I gave the instruction at the beginning for us to resource around the room and that supports our nervous system coming back to a sense of homeostasis and so these are all these sort of techniques and tools and and ways that support us having a more intimate relationship with our body and as we begin to take these practices into our everyday lived lives not just when we're on our cushion but in every aspect of our life we're going to begin to notice how much more tender we are, how much, how more attuned we are to ourselves and others. And that's going to allow us to turn our attention to remember that we belong to each other and to, um, to learn ways that we can be generous and other ways that we can protect um, our life and the life of other people around us. And so I hope that's a useful rambling response for you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you so much. Yeah. And, you know, and to speak to something too. And I think that when, um, you know, there's a lot of, of young, um, you know, young teachers or newer teachers who are coming out, a lot of us are queer. A lot of us are folks of color. And so having this attunement has been how we have survived literally how we've survived. And so um, if you're sitting with more and more of these um, emerging teachers, you're going to um, get a little bit more of that felt sense, the body wisdom and in, in our teachings. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Here, here's another uh, question that's come in, Booker. Um, I have found the occasional use of certain intoxicants such as cannabis to be a helpful nudge out of ego and into intersubjectivity and a sense of oneness in the world. I can see how continued use of intoxicants could be detrimental, but I have always had a hard time with rigidity around this precept. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I will give you my personal opinion. (laughs) Um, 
You know, the instruction is to care for intoxicants that cloud the heart and mind. And so things that create this barrier, this interruption to me being in connection with myself and with others. And I know that many people um, utilize plant medicine and it can be a really beautiful opening um, tool for them. And so I invite you for those people who are using plant medicine um, to, to sit with it for a moment and to say like, is this leading, you know? And, and again, I love the instructions. It was based on, um, um, there's a teaching that the Buddha offered his son Rahula where he's asking him to investigate his actions before, during and after. And are his actions leading him to, um, to deeper suffering, to affliction, or are they leading him to liberation and freedom? And so I invite you to look at your use of plant medicine and to see, you know, um, what is the mindset before you utilize it? So what are you thinking? What, why are you using it? Why are you inviting it into your body? Um, and then while you're using it, what is the mindset? How is the body? And then after reflecting upon it and noticing how it is impacting you, do you still have access to a deep connection to yourself and others? Is it causing any sort of affliction or is it leading you to a deeper sense of freedom and liberation? And only you can answer that for yourself. Um, a lot of people use cannabis as something to just get high with. And some people really use it as a deep, deep um, and beautiful and rich medicine that is, has a lot of healing properties. And so I invite you to explore and be on that journey for yourself. And again, as the Buddha said, to explore and know for yourself what is true. So thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. Here's another uh, question or request. Can you recommend resources for further understanding of the precepts? Well, funny you should ask because I just um, completed a four part video series for Tricycle Magazine, <laughs> um, which just got released a few days ago. And so I'm speaking about the precepts through the lens of Dharma, embodied wisdom and social justice. And also through the lens of the precepts, not just being a practice that we explore on the cushion, but a practice that we explore and engage with other humans because it is a practice that reminds us that we belong to each other. And so tomorrow, which is Thursday, I'll be offering um, a free webinar through Tricycle. And then the four part series is available for free. So please check that out. <laughs> Thank you for plugging my little commercial there. Okay, great. <laughs> and one of our members, Rick Kruger, has a question. He's raised his hand. Sure. So hey, I've Rick. unmuted you. Rick, go ahead. Um, hey, Rick, I think we spoke a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? Yeah, yes, we did. I'm, yeah. I'm so, so happy to see you again. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to see you. <laughs> um, this is such a precious uh, thing that you're, you open your heart to, to us and, you know, hundreds of folks here tonight um, and impart your wisdom. Um, do I have a question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what this is about, is, is if there's a question. I, I actually don't. I, I just want to comment that um, this whole uh, question of intoxicants and the way in which you uh, approach um, the illusion and, I guess, ignorance and harboring ill will. And what's, uh, what's the third one that I'm... That's um, yes, yeah, so the three poisons are greed, mm. hatred, and delusion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Just to and, keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I can see so clearly tonight how, how readily each of those clouds the mind and, and um, really encumbers the heart. Yeah. <laughs> And so, I, you know, I just want to thank you for that. And I, I guess I'm hoping that I can 
take just just a shred mm. of wisdom into the next moment, next moment, next moment. Yeah. Um, I I don't tend to drink a lot of alcohol. I probably don't smoke enough dope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So those aren't issues for me, but delusion and, and I, you know, I have to confess harboring ill will. Yeah. Um, it's awful. Yeah. It's just, it's just incredibly um, destructive. Mm. And yeah. So um, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to profess to, to try to do, something more compassionate and yeah. more loving. I give it a go. I really, really feel that that's a, because, well, I mean, what you said just about the, the degree to which our own happiness is so intertwined with those around us. Yeah. And that's yeah. Perfect. So, um, and so, and we plant the seed because sometimes it's not, enough for us if it's just us but we can but when we consider how our words or actions can impact other people hopefully you know that's a catalyst for us to really consider taking the heart taking to heart how we utilize these precepts and how we carry them through our everyday lives i want to make one other comment and then i'll let uh, others because I, I know we're almost out of time here i'm yeah. um, talking about the body so Rick, um, some a couple of months ago, mentioned um, in in a discussion one night about uh, how at some point the, the um, a deeper meditation or deeper quality of meditation is kind of letting go of the executive function of the mind, and I, I had no understanding of that at, at the time. But I think tonight I sort of got it and that what um the way i experience it is that it it is there's a sense in the body a sense of the sense of openness and you know where i'm not trying to mightily hold on to a thought or push thoughts away mm-hmm. as much as just listen just listen yeah and so you know with letting go the the um the higher functioning brain is letting go of the neocortex and dropping back down into the limbic brain. And I told people I wasn't going to be all neuroscience because that's Rick's game, but I really believe in that. You know, we drop into this animal brain, which is why when we are rotating our ma- our heads and looking at um, you no know, scanning of the room that's activating this limbic brain. You're activating your animal brain that allows us to feel into fight, flight, freeze, or appease. So it gives us more connection to that animal body, to the felt sense that allows us to be in relationship deeper with others. And so if you mind, I'm going to put a pin in for a moment um, if that's all right, because I, I want to move on to some other folks, but um, I hope that this has planted a seed for not just for you, but for everyone. So we can really think more about how um, we can uh, move these practices in, into our lived everyday lives. Mm-hmm. And so can I invite Brenda to share her question? Hey, Brenda, how are you? And Brenda, I think that you are still muted. Okay, there we go. Great, great. So lovely to see you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah, and thanks to Yuli for speaking up. Uh, So maybe this question will come in. I uh, really get it about greed and hatred and delusion, meaning really in a sense, uh, anger. So I don't know where in the um, skillful action anger falls, but we certainly have lots of reasons for that. Yeah. How can you just in a, a little way off your hitty, how can you <laughs> talk to us about anger a little bit? Because I certainly yeah. have lots of reasons for it. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And so I am going to bring in um, the words of our ancestor, Maya Angelou, to help me with this, with this response. 
And so Maya Angelou says, if you're not angry, you're either a stone or you're too sick to be angry. So be angry, yes, but mind you, you must not be bitter because bitter feeds upon you like a host, like a cancer and does nothing to the object of your displeasure. So be angry, yes, but you dance it, you march it, you vote it, you sing it, you talk it, you never stop talking about it. Yeah, okay. And if you noticed, I have memorized that quote, I have ingrained that quote (laughs) into my entire being because anger was something that I, as a younger person, as a younger activist, I was fueled by my anger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that anger unprocessed just burned me up and left nothing but ashes Mm -hmm. but when i brought wisdom Mm -hmm. to my anger when i brought the felt sense of my body towards my anger Mm -hmm. i realized that what i was feeling was actually sadness Mm -hmm. i was feeling impotence I was feeling shrunken and small. I was feeling like I didn't, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. And I mean, I, I come back to that. You mentioned Maya Angelou. There's this wonderful Nelson Mandela statement that holding on to resentment is like drinking poison and yeah. thinking that you are killing your enemy. It's just that I can't remember. I yeah. can't remember. <laughs> I'm going to give you another metaphor. So my friend Gina Sharp says it's like picking up a hot coal to throw at another person, but then you end up burning your hand as you're holding that hot coal, right? And so I love metaphor because it just helps us to remember in all of these different ways. Exactly. And so, yeah. So, you know, that anger is not just, it's not this big stuck solid mass it's made up of so many other things that we can actually turn our attention to we can't it's really hard for us to tend to a big mass of solidness but i can tend to the sadness i can tend to the fear i can tend to the emptiness i can tend to um you know, to the fear, I can tend to these individual things, Mm -hmm. but not as a big clump. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're so welcome. Booker, we have one more. Jack has had his hand up for a while. Hey, Jack. If you want to uh, go ahead, Jack. Sure. Yeah, the first is just a short comment is that uh, I uh, was in a situation where uh, I was given some uh, medical advice that uh, might be helpful if I was on a uh, antidepressant. And uh, what that has done is actually improved my practice by toning things down a bit. And uh, just want to comment on that, it's just a personal experience. The other thing is like, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm aware of sometimes, and actually more aware of it, is during, just as I walk in my life, there are just certain negative things uh, uh, which can rate can vary from the self denigration to uh, feeling left out, having like a, a an empty feeling. And I find when those things kind of come up, there's a, there's an impulse for me to react in ways that may not be the best way. Mm. Uh, and I guess my question is how by practice what kind of practice would be helpful in that kind of thing can you synthesize your question for me um yeah i just want to make sure that i'm getting like the 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 center the jewel of your question so can you just make it a little bit more pithy for me uh, okay uh, how how do you deal with all the, you know, this, <laughs> all those scrambled eggs that go on in your mind, you know, throughout your day? <laughs> How do you deal with all the scrambled eggs? There is so much, right? There's so much that's being thrown yeah. at us. It's like, there's so much that's just like, oh, you think you found equanimity? What about this, right? Yeah, there is so much that's mm-hmm. thrown at us. And so, um, 
there are a lot of different practices. And one of them, which we spoke about two weeks ago, was this practice of equanimity. You know, and and a meditation um, that I really love in equanimity meditation is to imagine yourself like a mountain and noticing how a mountain, um, you know, it allows uh, like trees to grow out of it and bushes to grow out and flowers and all these animals are living and buzzing around on a mountain, but the mountain stays still and solid. It understands that its nature is to be still, to not react to every single thing around it, but just to be still. And in that stillness, that stillness is not about inactivity. It's not about being apathetic or doing nothing. That stillness gives us pause to figure out what the skillful action is to do. And so I think of equanimity as sort of this space in between, um, you know, something happening and then our response. We take a moment to kind of drop into equanimity for that pause to understand how we truly are feeling about this, not what society is saying that we should feel about it, not what social media or the news media is saying that we should feeling about, about it, but how we are truly feeling about it. And then to respond with, um, with mindfulness, with skillful action. And so it's that pause, that sacred pause that we, um, you know, uh, that we need to be, uh, we need to experience. And the word invite it keeps coming into my head. So invite yourself into sacred pause. It's such a beautiful um, place to be. And I think that in that sacred pause is where you're going to find kindness a lot of kindness for yourself, a lot of generosity towards yourself, a lot of compassion towards yourself. Yeah. So thank you so much, Jack. And it's great to see you again. Same here. And so dear ones, this is, um, this is, the end of our time together. I'm trying to get a gallery view so I can see everyone again. So this is the time, um, the end of our time together. And again, just deep bows and gratitude for your kind attention and for embarking on this gorgeous practice and remembering that we belong to each other. And so for those of you who would like to stay and continue the conversation, um, there is um, an opportunity for you to stay and go into breakout groups with a few other people to continue this conversation. And so the question that I leave you with to explore is again, knowing how deeply our lives are intertwined. What gets in the way of undertaking the precept to protect life, to be generous, to protect the sexuality of myself and others, to um, be careful with our speech and to tend to these intoxicants that might cloud the heart and mind. So again, not only what interrupts or gets in the way, but also what gives you support what are the other practices that allow you to to deepen your exploration of the precepts?